Hello, everyone. Well, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Carlos Roman. He has been my friend since undergraduate school. Uh, he studied, el, bueno, mejor en español, va a ser mucho más fácil. Este, él estudió la licenciatura en física en la Facultad de Ciencias de la UNAM. Después hizo su tesis de licenciatura en el Instituto de Astronomía, este, donde fue con Cubicolino, con Javier Ballesteros. Este, podemos ver que más o menos de esa época se origina su gusto por el buen cine, como, como podemos ver de este lado. Después de, de trabajar tan arduamente en la licenciatura, y en el instituto fue a estudiar su maestría y doctorado en la Universidad de Florida, donde trabajó con Liz Lada. Después fue postdoc en el CFA con Charlie Lada y en Granada con Joao Alves. Desde el 2012 es investigador en el Instituto de Astronomía en Ensenada. Este, Charlie ha adquirido fama mundial como autor de... Este, de los cómics de las aventuras de Wilder Chicana, este, del superhéroe que lucha contra los símbolos de Christopher y de los astromonos, aunque también su fama compite con que es un gran promotor del de, eh, uso de los datos de el Sloan. Entonces, pues... Charlie, por favor, los dejo. Yeah, I'm sure that after the that infamous picture, he didn't listen to anything else. So that's fine. Well, and it's not fine, but that's the way it is. Uh, thank you. I, I, I'm, it's a pleasure to be here. They told me to speak in English, but I will speak. Um, Iria is for me a, 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 like a second home for astronomy in, in, since I am doing research in Mexico. Um, always coming here is, is what, actually, when I come to Iria is where I get ideas that <laughs> bubble in my head for a long time and then and then I, I, I get motivation to do stuff in Ensenada because we have until a few years ago I had very little interaction with anyone else uh, to do with star formation which is my topic of, of, of interest right because I only had like one other person in, in Ensenada doing um, a star formation science and it was nice to talk to him but it was also I was limited to for example infrared imaging But then uh, we got um, Jesus Hernandez. And, uh, and with Jesus Hernandez, we started a, a small group of star formation in Ensenada. And it has grown since then. And then we, we got involved with this project, which has been essential for our understanding of how stars evolved in their early time since their formation. And it's been a, a wide ride, very nice. Um, and I want to talk to you about this today. So thank you. This work is not, is not done by me only, actually. I am only a small part of a very large group of people. And here are very important names. One of them is Marina Kunkel. She's a data scientist at um, uh, 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 Vanderbilt. And, uh, and she's amazing. She, has, she, uh, she basically uh, allowed us to understand how to manage this as big data. And, uh, and, and then, of course, we have a team of people both in Sloan Digital Sky Survey and in Ensenada and in another place. Okay, why study the Milky Way? Being the universe so big, why limiting ourselves to this uh, not that very interesting place in the universe? Well, it is, it is uh, this, the, just as the study of our primary source zone allowed us to understand what, uh, how other stars worked internally or how they evolved. Our Milky Way is our main source of information to understand how other galaxies form, evolve, and are the way they are. 
So, uh, and this is not, uh, this is basically the essence of astrophysics. We understand one thing at a time, and then we understand the big picture. That's it. There's not, it's not a minimum task. This is a, it's the fundamental task. So, and this is the right time to do this detailed work in our Miffy way, because uh, we are gathering data that only our predecessors could only dream about. When I was a graduate student, I was, I was I would, I would not even, if they, they write me, they took me to write it. What are the, gonna be the, the, the 10 big developments in astronomy in the next 10 years? I will not even think or imagine things like this, right? Like, uh, like Isovista or like uh, uh, Gaia or, um, or the Hawk telescope in, 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 in Sierra Negra, right? Alma. We, we are now, at, at a, or, or the or the decant camera, we are now at a time in astronomy where we are getting. We are. I was talking to to Sundar this morning. We are going to get an exabyte of data every month in a, in very few years. You, we are humans are not going to be able to digest this. As astronomers, we have we have the task to understand the science behind all this data that we are gathering, and then we are going to have to learn how to teach the computers to digest this, this data for us so we can get science on. So it's a different way of doing astronomy from the way I learned it or, or the way we learned it 30 years ago. So one of the initiatives that started this big data astronomy uh, was the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. The, what is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey? One of the most important surveys in modern astronomy. Uh, it's, and mostly it's because it's a consortium of many people. It's a, it involves 40 institutions. Um, each one puts a million dollars. And then the Sloan Foundation, yeah, the, the same one that when you go to the bathroom, you see the, the brand of the <laughs> furniture you see Sloan, it's the same guy. So, so they, they, they put another $40 million on that. So for five years, for a period of five to six years. And, and during that phase, they use uh, actually a modest instrument, which is a 2.5 meter telescope, but they put a state-of-the-art instrument in it and they make an old sky survey. Um, the first two phases of the survey started in, at the beginning of the millennia in 2000. I consisted of, of a map of the northern hemisphere in, 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 a, in a series of optical wavelengths. It was an imaging survey that allowed us to characterize both the Milky Way population and the extragalactic population. So we got the Galaxy Zoo, we got the Wayster Service, we understood big scale uh, supernova catalog and uh, red chips and uh, large uh, and filaments in, 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 the, in the large scale of the universe. Mm -hmm. And only with a two meter point to point meter telescope. And then by phase three, which was about uh, when was it? 2008, I think. Uh, they, they started doing spectroscopy. So they added a system of uh, spectroscopy fibers. So the way, in, the, in the past, the way we did the spectroscopy, spectroscopy is very important, right? They say that um, uh, uh, an spectra is worth a million images because the, the spectra gives us information about the insights, about the physical properties of the, the object we are observing. But the problem is like, we learn to do spectroscopy one object at a time, passing the light through a sleep, right? But soon we learn how to do it by using optical fibers and, and getting data for tens or hundreds of objects at a time. So that's why that's what they developed with this, this fiber system. Um, they started um, uh, with an optical uh, survey called BOSS, uh, but then they moved to the infrared. Why to the infrared? Because we have the extinction in the infrared, in the H band, particularly where we study, is six times less than in the optical. So we can penetrate to the center of the galaxy or we can observe highly extinguished regions. So, and they, and they made this uh, instrument, which is capable of, let, let me just, I will go up to the, the same thing. This uh, is basically a plate, a metal plate, where, we, where you, uh, with a computer, you know where the positions of the stars are going to observe in the focal plane will be. Then you get a guy with a thrill. You open 300 holes at a time. Then you get a laser. 
they open three, 300 holes and they connect 300 uh, fibers. Actually, for the, for the during phase four of Sloan, they had to do it with a uh, slave, I mean, students and, and other people were hired to do this. And this is very, very interesting because one, once you have the, you know, the, all the fibers together, then they have another um, 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 instrument that actually uh, knows where each one of the points goes. And then that connects to another building uh, 30 meters away where the bench spectrogram is. So it's, it's, a, it's a complicated instrument, but it's a, it's a beautiful instrument. It allows you to observe 300 targets at a time in a seven square degree area at a time. So each one of those points in this map is one seven square degree field where you can observe hundreds of stars. And you can go back and visit every, every field, or you can make more plays with different targets in, for the same field. Uh, so that way you get a, a, a discrete, but a very complete map of all the components of the Milky Way, including the Magellanic clouds, including the Kepler field, including the, the galactic bulge. How they include the galactic bulge if they don't they have a telescope in the north? Well, they, they had to talk to people in Chile and they get another, another 2.5 meter telescope. Um, I will talk about that. And they also have a, a, an IF and integral field unit system where they put together groups of fibers so they could get uh, maps uh, in, of galaxies. That's called Manga. So that's another project that they 10,000 galaxies here. And this one the 655,000 stars. Um, by, by the time the phase four ended, um, they observed 2.6 um, million individual spectra for 650,000 sources, all the way down to age of 13 minutes. Um, so, and, and that's it actually it's one of the most impressive spectroscopic, spectroscopic surveys we need to ever done. Um, they, they, they extended the, the, the survey to the, to the south using the Las Campanas 2.5 meter telescope. They built an, a, a, a duplicate of the spectrograph. They put, it another, they put another spectrograph there. So they, that way, this became an all sky survey. The, the main program for the Sloan Nicholas, for the ACO is Apache Point Galactic Evolution Experiment or the Las Campanas Observatory Galactic Evolution Experiment depending on where you are, uh, consisted of studying giant stars, red giant stars, because they are evolved, the spectra are very stable. They don't have, they are not like, very complicated. They are not as complicated as other phases of the evolution of the stars, and they can get very precise the chemical abundances. The, the survey consisted on getting spectral classification, radial velocities, because they have enough resolution, and chemical abundances for 16 elements at a time for each star. And among all that craziness, because this is mostly to study the bulge of the, of the galaxy, the populations in the halo, the, the 10 giga population of the disk, and that's the main program. But then they were, with, with, there were a, a, a few groups of crazy people who were proposing to use Apogee to do something else, for example, uh, variable stars or binaries or young stars. And that's where Ensenada and where that's where me and other people got involved. We, we say you can, we can use because we are using infrared spectra, we can penetrate into those into, into dusty regions and start forming regions, and we can study young stars. And, and, in, and this is very important because if you are studying evolved populations in the galaxy, now you can understand how those populations form by studying their origin. Right? Or, or at some point, our song came out from a region like this, like Orion, where uh, it was the sun was forming in, a, in, a, in a, an embedded cluster inside, inside a large molecular cloud, and then the cluster dispersed, and now we have our sun and, and, and thousands of, 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 of sort of stars from, from that uh, star formation episode. Now uh, in circular, in more or less circular orbits around the, the galactic potential. But if we want to understand how this those stars got there, we need to understand young stars. So uh, the idea is to, to know how typical the solar neighborhood 
uh, star formation activity compared to the rest of the disk. We want to understand if, um, for example, Orion is a particular region like the one that the, the one that once formed our sun, or if a signal sex is, is, is at least similar, not equal, of course, but similar to those big giant molecular regions where globular clusters form a long time ago. Uh, also, very important, can we characterize the green main sequence stage of stellar evolution with the same precision that we, don't, we now have to characterize the main sequence or the, the, the giant branch? Because those are actually kind of stable. But the pre-main sequence, you guys, many of you understand that this is not that easy. Star, younger stars are embedded in gas, a lot of extinction, they have disks, they have variability, they have accretion, and they have a lot of things that make them different from the bulk stars, and they are more complicated. So can we get this enough numbers of the spectra, enough statistics to start getting precision in the parameters for the pre-main sequence? What are our current limitations in young clusters and the evolution understanding, right? Um, and so, so this, well, there was a big advantage using Apogee for this, and we convinced the TAC, the, the, the panels that, that we could do this science. So we started. So we ended up collecting data for almost 20 star forming regions. And um, along five years, we started studying the regions. We, got, we, we, we worked mostly on Orion. Orion is a prototypical region. We made a six. Uh, a six-dimensional map using kinematics, stellar properties from Orion. Uh, it was beautiful. Uh, but then uh, we have all these other regions, and it was complicated to keep the pace to, to do one study from one region at a time. So uh, I got the task of working on this paper, which was like a collective study of 16 star-forming regions with Apple. We collected data for, this, uh, for, for almost 20 regions, but we selected 16. Uh, they are all uh, uh, they are all regions with less than 100 million years old and located within um, a few a few hundred a few hundred to uh, to a couple of kiloparsecs away. Um, the spectroscopy uh, uh, the spectroscopic pipelines from ASCA can provide us with clean spectra, but they cannot really provide spectral parameters because they are created and they are programmed and they are calibrated with, for giant stars, so they don't work. When you, when you put a, a young star spectra, it gives you wrong parameters. So we need to use uh, our own spectra classification methods. So um, several efforts were made. And one of them is the Apogee Net Network. The Apogee Net Network is a neural, it's a, it's a machine learning method, and it's a neural network. and was developed by two students in Vanderbilt, uh, Olney and Sprague, and it provides Effective temperatures. Um, it provides a temper a gravity and a, 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 an average uh, metallicity. Uh, we are precise uh, for for so, super solar type stars and below. Apogee net is trained down. And so here, before going, this is just a map of the, all the regions we study. This is an example of. Uh, um, the fields in Apogee is studying, for example, lambda, <laughs> like Orion, right? We have hundreds of stars. So not all of them are going to be a young star. We propose targets from photometry, a, a astrometry, and, and other, other parameters, and we expect that we get as many young stars as possible. And then uh, we classify. So Apogee Net is a neural network. What do you do? Well, you collect data from all the sources you can for, uh, and for as many as possible sources where you have a, a precise classification in terms of temperature and gravity. So we have, for example, this, this, uh, this yellow uh, spot in the, in, the, in the right upper image is, a, is another neural network called the pain, the, the pain and the pain is, a, is a classified as stars spectra by spectra. And so we have, and it's more or less precise, but it's, it's only for stars below uh, 600,000 Kelvin. For hotter stars, we don't really have very good parameters because the synthetic models that we use to compare are not that precise. So this, the rest of the, of the, 
of the of the space. This is the key the space log gravity temperature was populated with data from the literature. And we use this as a training sample. We give this to the computer and we tell them, okay, your our data has to look like this. And then uh, we give it a model of evolution, in this case, for example, parts of polyol. And then the network under, uh, started to work and um, started providing parameters for the other stars where we didn't have classification, including young stars. The network is precise for low temperatures, but it starts to get very dispersed for higher temperatures, 7,000 Kelvin and above, then um, um, uh, uh, non thermal effect out from the thermal equilibrium, LTE effects are, has become, start becoming uh, more important. So it's much more difficult and the, and the models are less precise. And then we have another little code that allowed us to, once you have luminosity, when you, once you have the atmospheric temperature, and because we now have a very precise photometry on Gaia, and mass, et cetera, we can provide the luminosity. And we can estimate now also a mass and an age for each star using a, a, a model, of an evolution model in the pre main sequence. So we now have six parameters. Well, so, yeah, we have temperature, gravity, metallicity, uh, mass, age, luminosity, actually we have extinction and, and radial velocity. Uh, and this is enough uh, data to, to make studies of, the, of these regions. So we are now able to see the star forming regions in other dimensions that we didn't see before. Cool. Now we have ten effective temperature. This is Orion A. And the Orion Nebula cluster is the, is the densest part right there. Um, I don't have a laser, so it's a couple. Uh, and then, uh, as you can see, we target mostly uh, K and M stars. Uh, most of them are, uh, are they have, they, we, we know that we are doing things right because gravity is, for this star should be, for the youngest, for the younger population, should be lower than the typical mean sequence star. So it should be between 3 and 4.3, 4.4, instead of 4.5 and low. So we know that the network was doing more or less right for, the, for this, for this uh, ranges. We have metallicities, everything was solar in Orion. And this is a relief because we expect Orion to be solar. Uniformly solar, very low deviations. And we have also luminosities, the infrared, the, infrared, the young infrared stars are more luminous. And uh, masses and ages. And for each one of the 16 regions, we have maps like this. So the paper we published, we have to do figure sets where you can browse the maps for each, for each of the different regions. For, for some nearby regions, we have a, a range of, of the stellar parameters because we, we, we are closer and the brightness range of apogee allow you to, to study a, a wider range of stellar properties. So for example, this IC348, and we have a, a more or less wide range in luminosities. While if we go to Cygnus X, for example, the range is much narrower because we only, we, we, we only get to, the, to, to a limit, right? We are, this is a volume limited sample. So what we mostly studied solar stars in Cygnus. But we were able to cover a much larger range. Right? This is like 30 parsecs in, in long in across. The other region is like a couple of parsecs in, in range. We also got we, metallicity is, is more complicated to understand. This is not as precise. We, only, we can only get it for temperature below 4,500 4, 4, Kelvin. But we, are, we were able to, to see if, if there was any, anything out of the ordinary. For most of the regions, we got solar type metallicities, and that's OK. We were expecting that the star forming regions in the solar neighborhood are still solar type. They have solar type metallicity. They didn't, and something was wrong with our models, right? Because we know that the supernova the supernova events that change the metallicity in the disk occurred probably six or seven giga, uh, uh, giga years ago, not now. 
So what kind of precision do you get in the metal series 0.05 dex? Uh, yeah, the, we, we are between 0.2 dex for now, right? which is okay. Uh, in, if you want to get more precise, you need to go and study line by line, dealing with the, the abundance. We are doing that, but this does a much <laughs> more harder task. So for most of the regions we got, well, we expected we got the, the we got uh, HR Diana, which is one of the regions that are beautiful. They show that the populations are between one and 10 million years old. As we expected, we got a, a range of temperature depending on the region. We got a range of masses depending on the region. And for and and so this is a and, and this allowed us to make a catalog with almost uh, 3,600 stars in 16 different regions. So it's, it's a very nice catalog that you can just get by free. By just from the paper, and uh, and comprises uh, a very complete vision in the in this and very uniform also because we we had a uniform methodology for all these spectra in all these regions. It's very important. We notice also how difficult it is to is to is to type premium sequence uh, phase of evolution. When you try to estimate the age of a premium sequence star, then you are trying to get a star between one and 10 million years old. Not, not you don't have the, the error bar of one of several 10 uh, millions of, of years that you get when you when your star is two or three giga, giga years old. Now you have to get very precise. That's not that easy. And even the Current state of the art stellar evolution models don't have it very clear yet. For example, when we studied the Pleiades, right, we got all the parameters and we know that the Pleiades apogenet did a very good job. Then we get this sequence with subsequent sequence. And we expect that the Pleiades are 100 million years old. That's what you go to a paper and they say the Pleiades are 110 million years old. If you are to get on it, any other age, you are wrong. But then when, when we go here, see this purple line is 100 million years in, in the past quality model. And you see that, yeah, percentage of your, of your sample agrees with that age. But then you have another very large fraction of your data that doesn't agree. They say that it's a, it's a little younger. And if you get another model, the, the dashed line is another set of evolutionary models, just let's say it's a mesa. Stellar evolution model from Yale, you get another answer. And then if you go to the fine line in, this, in the papers where they present these evolutionary models, they say for pre main sequence, we don't provide as much precision. We would like to be careful when you get the start stage to start because you are not going to get it right. And so this is actually not a bad result. This is actually telling us that we are. Uh, we have to understand better how the evolutionary models work and where still have a, a, a lot to do. But we, we know how precise we can we can get. And we know what are our uncertainties in, in a parameter like H. -Rots. So this is something that we can now focus on instead of just doing um, or, or, or just uh, uh, assuming that something is has a value because someone else said it. Right? We have more information in this data. This is that this one apogee spectra is divided in three in three. It's a, it's a, it's a very narrow in 1.5 to 1.7 microns, but we can really divide it in three bands. And those are racket emission line. So many of these guys are clitoris because they are young. And we can then we, because we also have wise photometry, and they are these are mostly bright objects. We can get infrared excesses, we can get uh, racket emission. So actually, there was a paper um, by Hunter Campbell, pretty nice. They um, so they got the the an automatic pipe pipeline to detect and to measure the equivalent width of um, of the bracket uh, series that we were we got in this in, in the in the apogee window, and for all for over four thousand stars, um, we, we 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 were able to measure. Uh, we got very precise measures of, of, the, of the entire red bracket, bracket sequence and uh, 326 sources uh, 
were actually located in start forming regions, which is a nice sample of, pre, of a strong accretors in young, in young uh, start forming regions, and, pre, and they are mostly pre main sequence stars. Compared, for example, to Ezekiel Manso, Martinez, and et al. study from 2020, uh, here we have a, a accretion, accretion rate and number of stars. Uh, the, we mostly got um, the larger accretion rates. We are in more in the, the, our sample is actually more in the in the in the high accretion rate. This is in the in this in this graph we see the bracket decrement on how we expect we, the observed bracket decrement. And here are theoretical models that tell us what kind of decrement you should expect depending on the temperature and the density in the chromosphere of the star. And um, and we got mostly the we are doing mostly with the, the, the those stars that have higher temperature and higher accretion, uh, higher uh, uh, density accretion columns. And um, the and that's because the bracket emission, um, the bracket accretion compared to bracket accretion is uh, is, 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 is more or less com is conspicuous, right? It's, it's, uh, um, um, had a number here. Lost. Uh, sorry, um, I don't remember the exact, the exact rate, but yes, uh, it says it's uh, orders of magnitude below the, the, the intensity of the accretion in the bracket. The bracket series is hundreds of is is orders of magnitude is, is smaller than in the in the Valmer series or something else. Like so that's why we only got this very strong accretors. But this is a star, a very nice star. And we combine accretion information and infrared excess. And we can now get maps of uh, uh, stellar disk emission in all you know, these forming star forming regions. And we want to understand, for example, how these disks affect the spectra that we are observing. So we have an, a master student, Karina Cepeda, working on this problem. She's getting parameters using uh, spectral energy distribution from the star from photometry, getting the getting the parameters independently and then compared to the spectrum we to the parameters we take from the spectrum to see if in, in those startups they, they have a, a, an infrared X associated with this how is the disk affecting the parameters that we are obtaining from the from the spectral uh, pipeline track. This uh, and this is a first step in understanding the true nature of the discrepancies between uh, three main sequence stars and the model of counterpart. Another parameter that we're studying in detail is rotation. Javier uh, Serna is a student in our group who is doing a beautiful thesis uh, uh, where he developed models of rotation. And um, because we, from the apogee spectra, we actually can get a, a, a measure of the VC9 uh, velocity, the rotation velocity of the star. And we can compare these models with, actually, with actual real data. And we are also comparing those with uh, the periods uh, we, we can get from surveys like tests, where in space we can get very precise light curves for many of these stars. So this is something that is also another avenue where we, we can understand how, for example, rotation is affecting the pre-main sequence and how it's affecting the spectrum. Another, <laughs> another way to look at this is to see now at the uh, the kinematics. We now add radial velocities and we are now proper motions from guy, and now we can see this start moving. You can see how these clusters are actually expanding. And uh, for example, this is a thesis of Sergio Gonzalez Barron, it's a licenciatura thesis, and uh, he studied the Rosette molecular cloud. Those blue uh, contours are uh, uh, CO gas. And that is a, we have the same range of radial, we have a radial velocity. No, we, we have intermediate intensity and we have a temperature for the, for the, for the stars in the, in the average sample. When we classify our stars now, now in terms of the radial velocity and we divide our map in channels, in velocity channels, we can associate those groups in radial velocity with the velocity, radial velocity channels of the, of the spectral cube for the molecular cloud. And we can compare the kinematics of the star and the kinematics of the cloud. And to our surprise, there was two important things. One, 
that the motion in of the stars and the motion of the gas are very coherent. Uh, and also, this is a, a, a very similar study, but the Cygnus X uh, complex from Itzarel Aburto uh, in, in the Universidad de La Cruzana. But when we add the proper motions, now we see a different picture. We see how the stars are actually expanding away from their, from their forming sites. They are, as, as soon as the star ends up the, the forming process and the, and the cloud is removed, the clusters are no longer clustered. They are expanding. They are dispersing. And we see this as a common effect in almost every star forming region we observe. Right? We know now that the process of dispersion starts with the remotion of the gas. We knew before that the remotion of the gas is, a, is very rapid. And now we understand that the dispersion and the remotion of the gas are both comparable to the uh, to the uh, live escape time scale of the circumstellar disks. So once the circumstellar disk disappears, also the cluster disappears, and also the star, uh, and, and also the gas disappears, and you no longer can distinguish a, 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 a easily a primary sequence star from a from a from a from a few population. So we we know we this confirms that we we want to study young stars. We have to study them very when they're actually young and embedded in the in the clouds. And that's why we need inference. Now the problems with Apogee Net and other neural networks is that the neural network is just as good as the training sample. So you want to improve on the parameters, and you want to get eventually to the chemical abundances, or you want to get more precise parameters, you need to go back and compare your spectra with, with a synthetic spectrum model. There's no other way. And we try to do this with a, a, with a pipeline called InSync in a, for Apogee, but it was, it was complicated. So for, but we have a very, uh, then, then we, 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 we met Lucia Adame. And Lucia Adame, um, uh, in Senada, they started to talk to Mr. Hernandez and me, and, 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 and then we said, we have this problem, and she said, I know how to do this. There's a code by, there's an algorithm by Jorge Canto, the developer in Instituto Astronomia, which can, for example, you have a very large uh, a grid of models, and you want to know which one is the closest, you don't go and compare your, your observed the spectrum which is one of the models to see which one has a, the smaller highest square value. That's very inefficient. The way you do it is that you have to do it in a, in a way that you can try to see what, what is, the, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the most rapid path to the, to the, to the right answer. And that, uh, that can be done, for example, by selecting first a generation of random models and then to see which one is the closest, and then you get around the, 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 the smallest chi square values and another example of random, random, uh, of random models and, and so on. And this is called a genetic algorithm. And using that genetic algorithm, we were able to actually get very close to that, closer and closer and closer. So it, it has been taken a few years because you see it's extremely detailed in the figure work. But we know now that the code she developed, Tonali, uh, which is unsupervised, is not as rapid as the neural network, but it's, uh, it's, it's unsupervised, it uses this, uh, the, the, the genetic algorithm, and it's capable of working in, in any, any model grid that we know that, it, uh, that, that has the infrared spectra and allows to get to the closest, mathematically to the closest model uh, yeah, compared to the observed star. Not only that, uh, Tonali has a, an internal machine learning code that actually separates young stars from bracket em emission line stars. And very hot stars that we actually don't have models. And the last development that, she, that, that, that we did was to add, uh, to actually make what AfroGinet does, which is to, to use the, the, the key space to first know which gravity values 
you, we can we can do, and um, and this way we are able to say okay so this the star that we are looking at is most likely to be in this age range or this mass range, so we don't have to look at the entire model grid. We can actually do a more localized work, and using that which is called the pizzi, it's like a mini it's, it's called the pizzi because it's a miniature version of the, 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 the code. Uh, we are we are able now to to uh, some to, to to localize the to get more localized in the in the in the, the in the model grid and to obtain more precise parameters. Without the pizzi, the range of parameters that we obtain is, it can, can be very 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 noisy. <laughs> when we use the pizzi, we get to the right answer. Um, also, Ricardo Lopez Valdivia is testing this on a sample in the in the solar neighbor. We got uh, almost uh, two thousand stars with the most precise photometry and astrometry in the solar neighborhood within a hundred parsecs. We uh, that, that have average data, and we are now obtaining the parameters first in this uh, in this sample, so we can see how precisely we can really get into the into the low G temperature scale, how 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 if we got any correlations with metallicity or other parameters. So this is and and, and so we are gonna now be able to, to get to the to the problem of how precise we can get the, the premain sequence parameter. And we actually we, we think we are doing pretty good. The, this is for example how how we compare the temperatures we obtain from Tonali with the expected colors that we get from the photometry into mass, for example. This is a H minus K and J minus H. And the, the lines, uh, the blue line is a, is a, is a sequence from Picolino Malik, which is one of the, the, the guidelines that we use in spectroscopy to know what is the, the comparison between the spectral type, temperature, and color for any, any band. And, and the red line is a median line for, from, from Tonali in this sample. And so we're getting very close to the, to the, to the expected answer. Plus minus that dispersion that is actually telling us how good we can actually do this work. We are also, we also um, and then this is also the end here. We need to study also the massive stars. The massive stars are more complicated. We don't have synthetic models. If, they, if someone tells you that they have a, a model uh, that can actually get you the, press, the, the right equivalent width in the, in, the in the bracket lines, in the H band particularly, be suspicious because we try and we know that this is not possible yet because of a problem in the, in the pumping of the ultraviolet in the model. So um, that's unfortunate because we cannot use normal model. So one thing we did, for example, with the with the PhD student Valeria Mispreciado, was to actually get the equivalent with bracket lines and compare these to, to to spectral types that we obtained from optical classifications of the stars in another survey called Lamos. And, and we got a correlation. Now this this gives a scale that we can use, we can get because in the in the in the colder stars, we only get a very few lines. So you got two lines. <laughs> And you, you should be able to tell from those two lines what spectral type you have. Now we are able to do it. And we are now able to tell us also which temperature and which gravity is. And we're getting there. So now we can add the hotel stars to the, to the, to the HR diagrams. How long I am? About five minutes. Five minutes, sorry. So now I'm going to tell you this is about how this is going to explode. This is just, you know, this, this is just a, a, a small version of what it's done. Uh, I don't know how, we, how, how many of you have worked with the American astronomy, but the, the, the way they work is they, they, they have a very expensive toy. And they, they have lots of data, right? And the next step is always to get a more expensive toy to get much more data. So the phase five of the slow digital sky survey is to move from apogee, which is 650,000 
stars in the solar neighborhood and all components of the galaxy looks like this to the Milky Way mapper, which is now going to be a much more robust and monster sample. Uh, and the idea now is not now they, they understood. <laughs> so our, our library are important, binaries are important, um, uh, variable stars are important, young stars are important. But evolved stars, more evolved stars are important too. So the idea is now not only cover giant stars in the three main components, we're also to study all possible ecosystems in the galaxy across the whole entire, across the, the entire HR diet. And also to move from a discrete sampling to a continuous sampling. A sampling that is going to be adapted to the, to the increasing density of stars in the sky as you get closer to the galactic disk. So how, so in order to do this, you need to make a, to work in a synoptic way, you get to get shorter exposures. No problem, but uh, now you are gonna be able to, to make a uniform mapping on the galaxy. Uh, and the thing is to, and the idea is to get all the way, in the, to, to get a panoptic survey where we can study young stars, pre-main sequence stars, main sequence stars, bubble stars, dying stars, uh, 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 planet host stars, even floating planets, uh, brown dwarfs, etc. Supernovae, uh, supernovae uh, candidates, etc. Uh, X-ray binary candidates, etc. So, and um, the idea is to is to is to um, to get all those bright objects in in, the, in this in this volume limited sample, but across the, the entire sky in a, in a, in, a, in a continuous way. In order to do that, you need to move from the slave plug in place to another more clever system. And the way they did it is to invent, they invented this robotic position. And they built one for each one of the telescopes. And these robotic positioners are now able, actually, so they, 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 they are going to adapt to, the, to, the, to each one of the maps that you give it. You, you give it a catalog of stars, and, the, and the, the, the idea is that the robot can decide from the catalog you, you feed what is the most optimal sample that you can observe in that field, and it will accommodate the, 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 the fibers in that, those positions. And that you should be able to get both the optical and the infrared fiber. <laughs> so this is crazy, but it works. Maybe this, this is a uh, this is very clever system where you have a patrol area and you have a, a robotic positioner that actually moves in, in two dimensions to get to the position of the star in that control area. I'm not gonna get into the issues with the uh, now we are you are able to sample the, the field more uniformly. And in order to do that, you need to. So it's difficult to orient to orient on these but it's one of these things, right? So um, they develop an algorithm, mathematical algorithm, to do this, and uh, and the algorithm is called Kaiju. And Kaiju, what, what you do is like you know what 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 how you feel looks like. You accommodate the fibers in the best way you can. Then what you do is that you go back, you, you traverse the process to the to the, to the uh, folded position of the fiber, and then you reaccommodate the, from the from the from the previous configuration all the way to the new configuration. It's a complicated algorithm, and it has now very strange parameters like cost, energy, grid, and um, encroachment level. So it's a very fun read. Uh, and, but these parameters will minimize the, the amount of movement that you need for each position. So you can reconfigure the entire field in five minutes. Instead of the 15 minutes that you needed to change a cassette of fibers for each one of the fields with the plates. So now the system will be more efficient and that it will be able to actually adapt to the, to the to be more efficient night by night. <laughs> you can also, in an emergency, for some of you have a, 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 a target uh, an opportunity target you can add it to the catalog with the highest priority and, and tell the robot to observe it. Stuff like that can be done now. That couldn't be done before. And we are doing, and, and now the youngest star science is now a full science goal uh, uh, 
part of the, of the, of the, of the, of the survey. So we are not one of the main uh, yeah. parts of the, of the survey. And uh, this it's what's called um, Abyss, Young Stars. Um, it's, it's uh, Apogee and BOSS, BOSS is the optical system. It's Apogee, BOSS, Young Stars. So, and, um, and Abyss is able now to observe pre main sequence stars distributed in the, in the, in the galactic disk, cluster stars. Uh, variable stars, which are also become upper galaxy special and also um, 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 a survey of the of the, the more embedded sources in the list. Um, we are also able to uh, observe that we have a carton for OB candidates and also for massive young stars in the in the central in the center of the galaxy. And also in, in nebulous regions. So it's, it's, it come, each one of these cartons is a definition that tells you what each star. So, so you basically say, we don't know what a star, which one of the stars is young. So we only know the colors. But we, we give you these formulas. Each of these formulas will be a possible embedded star, a possible cluster star. We know that the special distribution that can be so. And then the, the if the target is on, on point and the and the robotic and the robot decides that it has enough priority, we'll observe. This is just uh, this is the this is from the description paper of the of the survey, and um, uh, the cartons are basically defining very simple near infrared border regions based on what we got from the Sloan the Sloan phase four. And so we, we are using both variability and, uh, and, and colors in order to, say, to tell the, the robot which, which regions in, in the parameter space can be young stars. For the different cartons, we got more or less precise answers now. The, the yellow stars are pre main sequence, or the, the best sample of pre main sequence that we got from the Sloan from the previous phase. And each one of these is a different carton in the, the, in the current development of the phase five Milky Way mapper data. Uh, for the premium sequence carton, we are doing pretty good. And um, for the cluster stars, we are doing pretty good. So for example, we're starting having, for example, with the, the embedded star definition. So we know now what we need to make correction. So this, um, so it's getting there. Um, the, the parameters we're obtaining from a boss and apogee differ in, in precision, but we also have, uh, but this, uh, this is a, a, a development stage, and we are developing a, no, a new neural network that is going to tell us uh, that is going to improve on this, and hopefully tonight we'll be also a participant in getting more precise parameters. Uh, one of the most one, one important, important thing is that we now have a, an OVA star carton. And uh, we still don't know how we're going to classify this with enough you know, precision, but, but we are getting now very nice uh, the, the spectrum for massive stars in both the optical and the infrared. And using, and because we now have the optical spectra, we are now able to have. Uh, other parameters that are very important, for example, lithium or H alpha, friction acid, the Balmer lines. So this is uh, this is important because we now have much more information and we can combine the information we get from the infrared and the optical spectra together in order to get more precise classifications. So, so I'm gonna leave it there. Um, so there's just a few things to take away. Apogee Net 2 uses the spectral labels for non neural network space the kind. And improves uh, over other methodologies by using a comprehensive coverage of the field space. Um, and is optimized for, to work with pre-main sequence star. However, the pre-main sequence star population cannot be labeled with the same precision that we, know we have for other uh, regions of the HR diagram. So at this point, we need larger samples 
to get the statistical robustness we have to get the precision in the parameters we want to obtain. And the, and the parameters and, and the processes, the physical processes that can affect those parameters are very are, are diverse and are complicated. So cell emission, rotation, the different forms of variability that we may see when start happening. And chromospheric activity, flarings, all of things are crucial to understand the main sequence start now. They, they are somehow in those spectrum, we need to understand and separate them from the, the, the what, what is the, the main emission from the central star. Uh, efforts like tonality might be able to provide accuracy or more accuracy and, and less uncertainty in the estimations, uh, at least down to the, to the precision that the synthetic models have. But, uh, and this along with more precise rotation velocity and cost normalization, we think are gonna allow us to get more and more precise and more, to go more deeper on the understanding. Now, for example, we have Ricardo and uh, Lofi Valdivia working on abundances on that, the lines of the spectrum. That's a, a, a very laborious work, but it will pay off when we really know if they which, which, uh, if they are, uh, uh, any real anomalies in the abundances of young stars versus the peak population. Uh, we are going to be able at some point to test magnetic lines because we have model magnetic emission, but we get we need to get the, 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 the precise scalar parameter. And all of this has to be both in some part of we need to be supervised so we can get to the unsupervised method to do the right thing. So it's a, it's a word that will require both of the astronomers on the computer. So it's very exciting. And, and, uh, and, and we're having a lot of fun for sure. So in order to do that, we have now a, a, a relatively large group of people working with us in Senada. We have a few um, researchers and um, um, not all of them do apology, but we, they, they, they also working with, uh, with things related to evolution of, cl of young clusters. So, um, we're going to get an ALMA person now next, uh, next year, I didn't read you. Um, so we're going to be a, a, a mini year. I idiot. <laughs> <laughs> we have three pods that we have a, a 14 students right now. So, so we're, we're, we're doing, we're, we're, we're happy that we have a, 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 a group that we can, we can play all together to understand this. And, and the other important thing I want to say here is a Sloan Digital Sky Survey and the fact that UNAM is a full member of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey means that all of you are members of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey because it's not the Institute of Astronomy paying the $1 million. It's the UNAM okay, to get there. So you want to get involved with Apogee or with Manga or the Milky Way Mapper or the Local Volume Mapper, which is going to be another survey, or the Black Hole Mapper. Just uh, let me know. I am the representative for UNAM right now in the, slum, in the, in the phase five. I can point in the right direction and or help you to point in the right direction. And, uh, and if you want to do some work related to this, please let us know. We will be happy to help. Start with questions. Uh, John, did you want to for lunch? Ah, sí, este, estudiantes, el que quiera venir a comer a las eh, dos en la entrada, eh, platiquen con Charlie. Y conmigo. <laughs> okay, so let's start with questions to the auditorium. Lisa. Tengo una, una pregunta, más que nada por curiosidad, en el algoritmo que creo que se llama Kaiju. Kaiju, no, Kaiju, no sé. <laughs> Hablas de unos parámetros que se llaman fobia y acupuntura. Caracamiento, <laughs> Tienes que maximizar la fobia y minimizar el parámetro de, de, de colisión. O sea, acucarachamiento es colisión. El acucarachamiento es que tienes una región con muchas estrellas, entonces aquí te vas, las fibras se van a... Van a ¿Has visto un cucaracha? No sé, 
se va a ver algo así. Entonces, eh, te recomiendo muchísimo el baby. Está, sí, sí, sí. Te gusta el tipo de cosas, o sea, es un baby súper divertido. No está fácil de leer, pero está súper divertido. Ajá. Uh, regarding the paper of the accretion rate measurements, uh, which clouds did you observe? And uh, it's Polish, right? It, it was, which clouds are included? And do you have more than one epoch? Uh, there's more than one epoch that was handled, um, but that was handled in a, in a by combining all the observations, all the epochs into one single so, Um We, they, they, they work with the variability so they could like uh, correct for the radio velocities. The, and the, the, uh, these measurements for the accretion, the bracket, the line measure was done for, uh, for, uh, for all the survey, for the, for the entire Apogee 2 sample. And from that sample, which is 650,000 star, they got four, over 4,000 that have a strong accretion. And from those 4,000, about a tenth are actually young, actually young star. And they are in all the suffering regions we observe. Do they include a few clues? Uh, all right. Typical? Yeah, that's, that's let, me, let me see if I can remember this. Yeah. Oh, so I can check it in the paper. Yeah, I see three. Uh, Perseus, Orion, Rosette, Cygnus, uh, Alpha Perseus, uh, Cygnus X. Uh, yeah, uh, not a few. Uh, that, that was in the plan. We wanted a few because we wanted the M17, we wanted the M16, but this coming. Corona Australis? Corona Australis. We have Corona Australis. Okay. We don't have a regular panel. Is it published? Uh, I can get you to that. <laughs> And uh, I didn't include I didn't include Corona Australis because we didn't, we didn't have a. But the, the, the parameters for the accretion are listed in the paper. You can get the catalog right away. And uh, but you will get and we we'll get to all those regions because we're going to study the whole disk. Wait, so if the region is bright enough, in then within the next two or three years, yeah, with eventually the, you will the get Milky Way mapper. So if they are not in Ap Ap Apogee, Apogee 2, they will be in, they will the, be in the Milky Way mapper. And in the Milky Way mapper, you will include massive luminous clouds like the 10 W51. Well, remember, W49, the, 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 the The limiting magnitude is H of 13. Right. So as long as it's an H of the less than 13 magnitudes, yes. Right. Uh, we have one question on Zoom. Gilberto, go ahead. Thank you, Charlie. So um, you said you have other data to measure infrared excesses and therefore um, accretion rates. Uh, no, the data, but yeah, a lot of stuff, yeah. Um, how young can you go in your measurements of accretion rates? I mean, can you go to protostars? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, we have from what I from what I get when when I did the the infrared access. Uh, Calculations. Yeah, I got a few protestants, not a lot of them. Sample here in the sample of Ryan, we have like three or four. Class But, one. Eh? Class one. Class one. Or class one candidates. So yeah, we got a few, but not 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 not, not all of them, of course. Because again, we are limited by brightness. Yes, of course. And with Abyss, how young do you think you can go? It's the same, but it's gonna be it's gonna be more data. So we are gonna if we, we had say four stars here, we are gonna probably get I don't know. So the youngest you say a few a few a few times hopefully. Okay. Class one no gets will be the the answer. Okay. Okay, thanks. If they are bright enough, yeah. But most of these guys are not bright enough. You need you need a, a, a another instrument of surveys. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Me. Thanks. Do we have other questions on Zoom? If not, any questions in the article? Yeah. Maybe just to complement Gilberto's point, maybe, uh, sorry if I am guessing what you meant, but uh, I guess you asked for that because you want to know the accretion rate from, your, from the filaments 
say to proto stars in simulate uh, like to compare with simulations, etc. No? But I would say that uh, a measurement of accretion rate like, like the ones of this survey is 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 more on the surface of the of the wave zone. No? So it's not a, a measurement of the accretion on, in the gas flow. No, no, no. But is is the accretion to the to the protostellar or junk stellar sur surface itself? No. So there is a a factor there that is not understood. No? Right. Yeah, but but the the accretion from the cloud or the filament will go through the disk and then to the star. Um, I guess there is some estimate or can be estimated how much, what's the efficiency of that transition through the disk to go to the star, isn't it? We, we don't know that, no? Ah, it's not known. Okay. I am involved. I am involved with a project that to study Orion A, 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 a portion of the Orion A, uh, with uh, the VLA. We're gonna get that in the K and new ones. So probably from there you can have more than at some point. Carra, Carlos Box. Thanks again. Thank you. I'll see you at lunch. All right. Uh, so let's start the speaker again. Do you have anyone next week? <laughs>